that, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Sherry Weppel. Uh, Sherry is the Director of Training and E-Learning Development at GP Strategies and has over 15 years of experience designing, developing, and delivering interactive computer-based and web-based learning modules. Her role is to drive innovative ISD techniques into the processes and provide valuable input on the state of learning and best-in-class practices. Sherry currently uh, recently completed her MS in Learning Science and Technology with a focus in gaming for instruction at Lehigh University. She's also earned an MS in Instructional Design and Development from Lehigh University and a BS of Art Education from Cutstown University. So with that, Sherry, I'm going to go ahead and turn presenter rights over to you. Thank you so much, Kayla, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Gamification is something that has been on the top of everybody's lips for the past couple of years now. Um, we've gone, though, from what is gamification and, a, a, and not understanding about what the possibilities are to I believe we've kind of strayed to the other end where there's a misunderstanding about what gamification is. People now, are, as I'm talking to individuals, are starting to have a staunch opinion of, I like gamification, I don't like gamification, gamification can work, gamification can't work. Yet I still don't think that we fully understand what is the range that's included within the concept of gaming in for learning in the workplace. So that's what we're really going to talk about today. We're going to start with a quick poll um, just so that I can get a, a little snapshot of where all of you are at. So if you think about not working at home, not any of that kind of um, socialization type gaming, but if you think about strictly your work environment, um, do you have any gaming at all going on at work? Um, do you use any kind of a game-based portal? So this might be something where you get incentives. It might be something where you have an avatar. Um, it might be how you access the learning that you take for your organization. Do you participate in a course that uses game principles like scoring and characters? Are there courses that you've taken um, in your organization that include uh, those types of engagements? Um, or have you taken courses that include game-based assessment? Uh, select the one that most applies to you. So which one are you doing most frequently? Um, and that just gives us a little bit of an idea of what you're currently doing, what your current experience is, um, because that feeds into a lot of how you feel about gamification personally and how um, gamification may or may not be working for you. So we're just going to give it another couple of minutes. Um, not another couple of minutes. We're going to give it another couple of seconds and see where we're going with that. Um, again, gamification is an interesting, an interesting type of an engagement that people are, are starting to use, mainly because it really depends on how it's implemented as to what the degree of success is. So it does take a lot of thought, and that's what we're going to go through today. So I believe our polls can be ending, and it looks like most of 61% of you are not participating in gaming at all at work, which is not surprising to me at all. It looks like the majority of you have, are not using a portal. You're really either using um, a course that includes some gaming principles or using some sort of game-based assessment. So that's pretty standard with what I'm seeing across the industry. But let's start to explore those options in greater detail. As we start to talk about gamification, it can often feel like a roll of the dice, um, starting to gamble a little bit with your learning strategy about trying some new things, trying to engage the rest of your organization, and gamification has, at least to me, started to feel like this Band-Aid um, that learning organizations are trying to put on a particular learning problem. If we're not getting the completions that we're looking for, if we're not getting the response that we're looking for, let's just put the gamification Band-Aid on it and see if that helps. Um, and really, if you take that approach to it, then the ability for you to be successful is probably going to be pretty slim. Um, what we want you to think about doing, though, is to start to think about this, this game, um, this game board that we have in front of you, and how you might strategically plan out what your gaming strategy is going to be in your organization. So we're going to step through this step by step, um, start to look at some examples and explore gaming as a holistic approach. So the first recommendation that I have is to stop and brainstorm. So before you just jump whole hog into some sort of a gaming uh, type of an experience, think about your audience and make sure that this is going to be something that's going to resonate for your audience. Um, also consider what kind of infrastructure you have within your organization. So if you have an, an environment that doesn't have a really strong internet connection or maybe 
you have people who are on the road and might not have any internet connection at all, don't put anything in place that's going to keep them from getting this learning. Consider other needs that you have, um, your timeline, your budget, but really consider your goals of what are you trying to accomplish. If you're not getting the completions that you're looking for, gamification might not be the solution. If you're not getting that transfer of knowledge that you're looking for, that might not be the solution. You really have to figure out what are you trying to do um, and make sure that this is the right solution for you. If you want to kind of dip your toe in the water and start to try a little bit of gaming, you could try with some mini games. So getting rid of that go big or go home kind of a methodology and start thinking about what if I just incorporate a little game here or there. Um, so maybe I have a compliance training that I need to do and I just want to put a tiny little assessment instead of taking my 10 question assessment at the end and having that be multiple choice, maybe putting kind of a gaming overlay over top of that to make it a little bit more fun, to make it a little bit more engaging. Also helps re reduce the multiple choice always choose option C methodology. Um, I actually had an interesting conversation with one of my favorite customers yesterday where we were talking about gaming and we just, we kind of illuminated the fact that gaming underneath it all is typically a lot of multiple choice. Um, so thinking about a different approach and then seeing how that resonates in your organization. Um, so seeing if there starts to be a buzz about how that particular course was handled other than against other courses and maybe that is your, your signifier that you should be heading in that direction. So an example would be in this compliance course, we could have asked a multiple choice question that said, um, you know, what are all of the areas on the forklift that pose a hazard? And it could have had a list of five or six things to choose from. In this scenario, we added a timer, we added some hints, um, we added a visual representation for them to select and, and made it a little bit more fun and a little bit more engaging. And also the benefit is a little bit more realistic of they're actually looking at the the hazard and, and selecting it. So they're having some realistic interaction with the content instead of just choosing from a list of options. We also want to think about maybe taking that next step and going towards game-based learning. So this is where instead of just having a little mini assessment at the end, you might have the entire module or the entire learning experience be some sort of a game. Um, one of the most success, successful games I've actually seen was with one of our customers uh, where they did a live they called it a stimulation, but it was on Basic and Lean Six Sigma, um, where they had an entire day where the day was literally a game. Um, you had a character, you had a role to play, and you learned a lot along the way. Um, but it, you had an option of do you want to sit in a class for eight hours or do you want to participate in this live simulated game type of an environment where you did keep score, but everything was very relatable to the end business goals. Um, so it wasn't just an arbitrary score, but the score was in relationship to customer satisfaction. It was in relationship to um, number of errors. It was in relationship to the things that matter in your organization. So instead of doing gaming from a, yay, I scored 15,000 points, do it in relationship to the things that matter to you and the, the kind of the, the important things that you want your organization to consider. So think about creating that story that goes around the content. Do I want you to go through 15 screens of information or do I want you to know why that information is important and what I want you to do with it once this training is over? This also helps you kind of reduce the scale of what you're trying to do. Try to create a smaller module again, send that out, see how it resonates in your organization and then kind of expand from there. So we're definitely gonna hear a theme of piloting throughout this session today. So here's an example of there's a lot of information that needed to be covered in this module, um, really helping sales individuals gather all the information that are going to make them successful. So what they needed to do was they needed to go through these rooms, and in each of these rooms there was content that they needed to learn. Once they got that information, they obtained a key, and their goal was to get all eight keys um, by the end of the learning experience. So it's just a little twist um, on a regular status counter or or any kind of a regular e-learning module, but it can really start to resonate and build that um, dynamic that you're looking for with your learners. Again, really cannot stress enough to, um, to pilot small. So you may, and you can see we, we kind of walked up that ladder to the pilot, you may want to stop at those mini games and those games and pilot just those two experiences and see how gaming works in your organization. If it doesn't work, that's okay. 
Um, you know, you may want to try to do more hands-on experience. Maybe you want to do more scenario-based experience. Maybe you want to do um, some coaching models or some other strategies to improve the experience for your learners. And maybe gamification just isn't it, and that's okay. Um, you know, it's important that you take that time and start to, to examine your audience and the challenges within your own organization and make those decisions. Um, so piloting small on a mini game or a game is something that's not going to be really expensive. Um, it's going to be something that you're able to achieve in a relatively short period of time and then take action as to what you're going to do with that. Um, making sure that you're using something like an agile methodology so it's very flexible, moldable, bendable, um, so that you're able to make changes on the fly uh, and ensure that your learners are in fact getting what they need. Now, if you choose not to pilot, you could go with the portal methodology, which is what a lot of people are actually thinking about when they talk about gamification. Portal methodology would be using them for motivation, using them for competition. Um, that would be where you start to have avatars and badging. And that works for a certain type of individual, a certain type of organization. You know, particularly, we see a lot of success in sales. Uh, we see a lot of success in very young, um, new people entering the workforce. Things to consider there is making sure that your solution is malleable and expandable as well. I cannot stress enough how great it is if you can do a gamification portal that has an LMS in the background. So if 10 years from now you decide that you don't want to do gamification anymore, all that data isn't lost. Um, you could have that LMS in the background that's still storing and capturing all that data, and you can always change your approach later on as opposed to trying to build something from the ground up. So as an example, um, at GP Strategies, we actually have an LMS called GP iLearn um, that we use to host some of our content. And as a part of that, we can actually gamify that experience too um, for our customers. So here's an example of on the back end, it's the same LMS that we use for everything else. On the front end, it's actually there, you can have a little neighborhood, you can have awards, avatars. Um, so instead of seeing the standard list of courses that you have to take within a particular learning path, you actually see houses and buildings, and you see everything framed up in a story or a theme um, to motivate the learners to be able to take that. Now, that's not what we use personally for GPI Learn out of the box, mainly because, again, it may not be the right solution for everybody, but it's okay to have it as an option for certain organizations if it would work for them. Again, even if you're going with some sort of a portal-based solution, you're going to want to pilot that before you go through a full-scale implementation. Choose your early adopters. Um, choose the people who it would most resonate with, people who are going to give you honest and candid feedback. Um, those are going to be the people that you're going to want to involve in that pilot. Making sure that you're also incorporating a variety of solutions. So inc incorporate some solutions that are more standard. Um, you know, maybe include some coaching type examples, maybe include some scenario based examples. Use this as a, a process to test all of the different ideas that you're thinking of before you jump all in into one solution um, and then have to wait a year or two and then see if you're getting the results that you want. Um, piloting is something that we often don't make the time for, uh, but honestly in the long run it saves us time and it saves us a lot of money. Um, because we're able to get those rich details and the rich responses in a quick fashion. Um, it is possible that after that pilot, you may want to go back to go, um, and that's okay. You know, admitting that you get to the pilot and you start looking at the results and you go, gosh, you know, in my organization, I really thought gamification was going to work, but we're not seeing any increase in retainment. We're not seeing any increase in transition to the job. Um, we're not seeing any, if you're not seeing the results that you want, um, don't be afraid to go back and brainstorm. It may not be necessary to throw the whole thing out, um, but it may be necessary to start to retool how are we using them. Um, it may be necessary to retool what your approach is. Um, it may be necessary to add or remove components to make sure that you're getting the results that you're looking for. And at any point in time, you can return to this brainstorming, brainstorming section to keep things going. So I encourage you as you're going through the process, even as you're going through iterations, brainstorming, showing it to people, um, getting other people's perspectives because that's going to be the critical path in being successful. And then finally, if you've gotten through the pilot and you've incorporated some of the feedback, it's go time. 
Um, you know, you need to incorporate any of the changes based on the pilot feedback, um, making sure that you've tested the solution thoroughly from an infrastructure perspective for specifically. Um, because as you, you don't want to go live and have done all the change management and communication only to have the platform not work. So you also want to consider um, getting frequent feedback from your learners as well. So making sure that even after you've implemented, don't just walk away from the solution. Make sure that you're constantly asking questions. Make sure that you're checking on your stats. You know, all too often we have systems that gather a lot of data and all too often we never look at it. Um, so make it a point to look at the data that's coming in. Look at things like how long your learners are spending in any learning solution. Um, look at how frequently they're accessing a portal or a platform. Um, make sure that if you're building any of these kinds of solutions that you can track that kind of data. Um, because really when you want to you want to start looking at time on task, um, you want to start looking at the frequency that they're accessing the information, but then also make sure that you have some way of measuring results and results that matter. Um, so anything from satisfaction to their ability to transition that to their responsibilities on the job, um, you know, any of those things that truly matter, that's the point. I mean, that's the purpose. And that's the piece that we sometimes lose sight of when we start to look at things that look really cool, look really fancy, look really sharp. Um, if it doesn't get the job done and if it doesn't train the individuals, then it's something that's not going to work and it's something that's not worth doing. So it's important to really, even though you hit go, make sure that you correct anything else that you might need to correct. And make sure that you also keep in keep it in sight throughout um, your experience. So don't just deploy and walk away, but three months in, six months in, nine months in, continually check because your employee dynamics change. Um, the, the world around us changes so frequently that you may need to continually change that approach. So remember that this is a continuous process. Uh, we do have that stop in there because we need to, every once in a while, stop and brainstorm again. Um, start to look at our organization and, and I'm always kind of amused at how we keep on cycling back through the same solutions and eventually we, we come to terms with we wanted everything to be in e-learning and then we realized, okay, everything in e-learning is not going to work. We still need to have that hands-on. We still need to have that on the job. And then we start to head too far to the left or too far to the right. So it's important for us to continually stop um, and think about some of the solutions that we're doing and maybe switching up our approach. So at this point in time, that ends the presentation, but now we have time for some questions. So if you have some questions, in, um, you can enter them into the Q&A module. Um, and I, we already do have some questions here, so I'm going to start answering those right now. So uh, Troy asked if I could explain the choose option C reference. I absolutely can. Um, so from a multiple choice question that's a tried and true method of taking a multiple choice is that all too often the answer is option C. Um, so I could do an entire presentation on assessment writing and how to write proper assessments, um, but it's making sure that the, the questions aren't so, so obvious um, that the learners know exactly what the answers are. Um, it's just a, it's kind of an old joke that when people were writing assessment questions and they were figuring out what um, response A, B, C, and D were, that the right answer was typically option C for some reason. So people would go through and just do C, 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 um, and they would get all of the correct answers or they would think that they were all the correct answers. Um, some other questions that we have are, so are there any solutions that are tried and true and will always work? I'd love to say that there's some sort of magic wand. Um, I've actually, I think in the past week, read two different articles from different individuals on LinkedIn about gamification, and everybody's kind of coming to the same conclusion of it really does depend on your organization um, and that it's not a one-size-fits-all one solution. So it's something that we need to consider is who your people are, um, what their likes are, what their dislikes are, what their bandwidth is, what their time is. Um, and figure out what those dynamics are before you decide what kind of a solution you're going to implement. So, for example, if you have an organization that doesn't have a lot of bandwidth, doesn't have a lot of time, um, you're not going to want to create them this training module that's going to take them forever to complete as a game. You know, they may be more of the mindset of, I need to get this knowledge, I need to get it now so that I can go and sell more, do more, be more. 
Um, in that case, it's still fine to do things that have gaming aspects to them, but keeping in mind that time constraint. Um, all too often we love the concept of gaming, we love the thought process of gaming, uh, but we forget that this isn't the, the Xbox type of an experience. It's not like we're coming home from work and we're going to play it for hours and hours on end. Um, you know, we want to consider that this is still learning. People need to uh, be able to, to get the, the information that they need and they need to be able to get out. Um, so we need to keep that in mind as well, making sure that you're creating something that's going to work in your environment, that's going to work for all of your learners. Um, some other questions that we get are, um, what is the effectiveness of a portal-based solution? That's still, I think, time is going to tell. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing now is people are implementing portals and, and sometimes it really works and sometimes it really doesn't. Um, sometimes it's not the portal's fault. So one thing to remember from a gamification perspective is that communication is key. Uh, making sure that you're communicating your learners, making sure that you're not using the if I build it, they will come approach. Uh, there needs to be some sort of strategy around um, how you engage those learners, how you keep people coming back to the solution. Um, I'll actually use social, me social media as an example too, or social collaborative tools. Like if you take a Yammer for instance. Um, a lot of people implement something like a Yammer in their organization and then they complain that Yammer doesn't work for them. But they've never built a reason for, typically, never built a reason for people to go there. Um, you know, they've built this social infrastructure where people can collaborate and talk, but then they don't have anyone moderating it. They don't build any learning activities that encourage people to go out there and, and use it. So people don't know what it's for, um, don't really necessarily have the time, and then it sits there unused. So if you're going to create some sort of a portal uh, from a gamification perspective, make sure you have a change management plan in place. Make sure that you have some ideas of how you're going to implement this and then make sure you're constantly reaching out to them, reminding them, um, or perhaps providing them other means of motivation, such as the number of um, points that you get gets you some sort of a prize, um, emails that reach out to them and tell them to go out to the portal to do something or another. Uh, you know, there's that satiation aspect to be concerned with as well. Um, an example of that would be, I actually have a Fitbit, and the Fitbit worked for me for about the first six months because it was getting badges to the left and badges to the right. It was fantastic. Um, but then after a while, the badges started to get harder to achieve, and it would be a month or two before I would get the next badge. Um, and so I kind of stopped paying attention to it. So it's important to keep that constant contact um, because that's where you're really going to get a lot of your benefits. And it looks like that's the, the last question we have for now. Um, so, Kayla, I'm going to turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Sherry. That was a great presentation, as always. Um, if you still have a question, go ahead and, and keep them coming in because we are a few minutes over, though. What we'll do is um, we'll tab any of the questions. It looks like we might have actually missed one. So. Um, uh, what we'll do actually is, is Sherry always puts together a great blog post after our sessions, and that will include um, a list of all the Q&A. So if we miss anybody, we'll be sure to get that or if another one comes in. Uh, also, that will include some key takeaways from today uh, and a, a link to the recording and the slide deck. So um, with that, uh, I want to go ahead and thank everybody for joining us today. Sherry's contact info is on this last slide, and you'll be getting her contact info also in the email that we send out. Um, and we hope that you can join us for the rest of our Learning Trends series and, of course, all of our other great webinars. Our next session will be next week. Uh, this will be on the neuroscience of learning, and this will be on January 14th. So for GP Strategies, I'm Kayla Ross, and I wish everybody a great day and a great rest of your week.